it. I never thought I would. And coming is such a surprise. Oh, then I was finishing my breakfast in Morva when the phone went. My friend said Fred was on the line inviting me to stay. Oh, oh I didn't need asking twice. Though my room at Morva is very pleasant. Anyway, my friend packed my bag and by the time Fred and Mary were in Carmarthen, I was in my hat and coat waiting. <laughs> oh, you you like my berry? Oh, it came from America in the bundle. The Dylan Thomas appeal. <laughs> Why they sent clothes, goodness knows, from America. They, they certainly weren't short of those, but they, they sent some lovely ones. Yeah. But C Kathleen never wears a hat, so she gave it to me. <laughs> Yes, yes, it does suit me, doesn't it? Mm. It's not one that I'd have bought, mind. Well, you wouldn't see it in Carmarthen anyway. A bit too dressy for them. <laughs> oh, dear, dear. I'm so full of myself I haven't taken a bit of notice of the baby. Ah, oh, bless her. Crying for mummy, is she? Oh, her cheek's a bit red. Are those nasty tussy pegs hurting my little lamb? Ah, oh, come to Granny then, come on. Granny kiss them better. Oh, oh dear, dear. Well, she's never seen me before. You can't expect it, really. Mummy won't be long, pet. There. Oh, and there she is. And a lovely big smile, too. Ha, <laughs> ha, love her. Oh, thank you, Fred. Perhaps you'll take my case upstairs. I, I won't unpack. Just yet. I'll take a bit of a rest. Not that I've done anything, mind, but sit in the car. Do you know how it is? Travelling does take it out of you. <gasps> ah, there. Drink your lovely orange juice, pet. Have a lovely long sleep. Granny, see you when you wake up. Ta-ta, lovely girl. Ta-ta. <laughs> bless her. Expect her auntie spoils her. Mm. I used to spoil Nancy and Dylan too. Wish I had them to spoil now. Lovely place they've got here. Dylan used to love Gower. Walked for miles when he lived in Swansea. Always came back to see the boys when he left. Couldn't have lived without it. Not Kathleen though. Oh no, no, she wasn't a bit keen. Mind, they nearly took that big house in the middle of Rosilly Bay. But Dylan would never have managed that rough walk. It was too far from the village. And then the school for the children, right on top of Rosilly Downs. They did go over it. They liked it very much, yes. Oh, poor thing. She's like one demented now when she passes Dylan's hut. Screams and shouts. Throws herself on the ground, completely out of control. Well, I hope she behaves better in Elba. She and Dylan were very happy there, and she's gone back. So far, so good. There'll be no urgent telegrams, thank goodness. Oh, yes. Yes, I'd love a cup, please. No, no, ju just a cup in my hand. That'd be lovely. Thank you very much, yes. Yes, 1937 it was, they married. We were living in Bishopston, and we had this letter from Cornwall. I have news for you. I'm getting married. Oh, Daddy wrote back straight away. Do you realise it's for life? For better, for worse? <laughs> and what do you think? Dylan wrote back. You'd rather marriage to living in sin, wouldn't you? <laughs> what can you do with a boy, Daddy said. And he sent him twenty pounds. Yes, it was, yes. But then they came down to stay then. Oh, oh. so stagey she was. Purple velvet coat right down to her ankles. And everyone wearing them short. But her hair was lovely. Oh, like a picture the colour was. Lovely. There you are. 
French mother and Irish father, and a bad lot he was. Her mother used to say, you know, Mrs. Thomas, in every large family, there's always one difficult child, and that one's Kathleen. There we are. I wonder sometimes if I made her worse. Well, when Dylan died, I moved from Pelican House to the boat house, you see. And then she'd be out, come back at all hours. People would come in and say, Sorry to hear Mrs. Thomas made such a scene in so-and-so's last night. I'd hear of something I, I was completely unaware of. Oh, it got so bad, I, I went back then to Pelican House. And then... Then my heart gave out then. The doctor tells me I've got angina. Just like Daddy. Poor Daddy, I, I lost him Christmas time. 1952. Still, I don't see why I can't live a good many years yet in Carmarthen, away from all the old gossip. Especially now they've taken the pins out of my leg. Would you like to see them? I've got them here. Great now. I've got them, I can show you. There we are, look. Look at those. Four inches long. They were in my leg as sure as I'm sitting here. They got very rusty indeed. I couldn't, I couldn't walk for months. Dylan used to come and see me every day. Take me out in the wheelchair if the weather was anything like. <laughs> yes, after the operation, that was, of course. <laughs> he did a lot of work in Pelican House then. Under Milkwood? Well, the end of it, anyway. Well, I was on my own, you see, and he could get more quietness then. The children were always noisy in the boathouse, and if he asked Kathleen to keep them quiet, he... She'd send out for more from the village. <laughs> yes. He was always writing from a child. Never did his homework. Oh, oh, oh no. He used to go into Daddy's room in Cumdonkin Drive to work. <laughs> and then Daddy'd say, I'd leave him a little bit. And he'd leave him. Then he'd go along to peep. We had a sort of... Um, window glass you see at the top of the door and he'd go along he'd say i think he's working i'll leave him a bit longer again then presently just go and see and have another peep and you'd hear a scuffle drawers open papers being pushed in writing poetry he was not doing his homework at all <laughs> oh thank you very much that's lovely thank you Oh, this. J just one. Thank you. Right. Yes. He was only ten when that first poem went into the Western Mail. Wales, day by day. It was the first he had published. And he had ten shillings for it. <laughs> but we kept the cheque. We, we didn't put it in the bank or cash it and... Daddy gave him the money, yes. Oh, that's lovely. But I don't know where it is now. We kept it for a long time. It was in a drawer somewhere. Let's look for it. He had a lot then in the grammar school magazine. Yes, that's right. I remember that one. It was about sailors buried at sea. <laughs> Daddy used to come home and say, so-and-so's gone to the front again. <laughs> Dylan would go out to our front to look. Never anyone there, of course. <laughs> yes. Mind, he was only four when the First World War ended. Hmm. But uh, he used to say sometimes he was born in 1912. He always wanted to be older. Well... He was so much smaller than the other boys. And, of course, Nancy was eight years old when he was born. And he always felt a bit inferior. 
That's right, yes. <laughs> and lots of those stories and poems he wrote at the beginning had to do with things in the house. Now, his grandpa's story. Now, that was one. Daddy used to tell him in the mornings when I was busy downstairs. Daddy's grandpa it was, of course, not Dylan's. And then Anne Jones, my sister, he saw what a grim life she had. Drunk her out of house and home, her husband did. She even had to borrow money from the family. And he it was, left Dylan outside the pub while he was inside drinking. Dylan put that in a story too. Yes. Oh, as the baby settles. Ah, oh, you'll be glad when those old teeth are through. Yes, I know. I remember. <laughs> you know, I, I'm still talking about Dylan. <laughs> yes. Well, after the grammar school, he went to work in the evening post. Oh, we were all disappointed with that. Calling in the police station and the hospital every day and meetings and funerals. <laughs> Half the time he was playing billiards in the YM. Never went near the hospital at all. <laughs> and then, I remember, the matron died and not a word in the evening post. Oh, oh, oh. He nearly lost his coat that time. <laughs> well, the Charlie Fisher, wasn't it? And Eric Hughes, he was in the Evening Post. Yes, Eric was with him a lot in the little theatre and the mumblers. And Nancy and her first husband. Yes. She lost him, you know, very suddenly. Um, he, yeah, yes, that's right, yes, he... He was, yes, a big fine fellow, yes. Well, actually, I've been a little bit naughty. I, I've told a little fib. But you know what they're like about divorce in Carmarthen. So I tell people that he died to protect her. And you know, I've even come to believe it myself. Oh, I, I should have remembered you both knew him, of course. <laughs> yes. Oh, poor girl. She tried to make it up three times. As a matter of fact, he, he came to see me a few weeks ago, asked what had happened to her, asked how she'd got on with her second husband. Oh, he was a lovely man, lovely fellow. Do you know, he paid my rent after Daddy died and allowed me two pounds a week until he married again. Couldn't face going back to India alone. <laughs> oh, what do you think? He invited, he got married, you see, from my house in Larne, and he invited Kathleen in for a drink. And what do you think she said? What if I throw things about and fight? You won't be able to throw me out. No, he said. But I'll find somebody who will. Oh, there was no trouble after that. No, no, one will be enough. Thank you. I haven't finished this. Thank you very much. <laughs> yes. Well, after that, I was on social security. And you know, they found out I had 75 pounds in the bank. And the little theatre, 50 pounds was in that. And they cut my allowance by sixpence a week. How mean can you get? Anyway, I'm all right for the moment. And I'm going shopping in Swansea if they'll take me when I get the chance. What should I say for a rainy day? <laughs> I, a, a nice gold bracelet for this watch that Nancy left me would be nice. It's a lovely watch. But it could do with a better bracelet. Mm -hmm. You know, Dylan was staying with Nancy on the houseboat in Larne, in, um, 
what's that place called, Chertsey, when he met Pamela Hansford Johnson. <laughs> yes, he'd been writing to her for some time because he was sending poetry to the Sunday referee. And, uh, well, one year Pamela was the best and then the next year it was Dylan and after that, well, he always stayed with Pamela when he went to London. Until he went to stay with Fred, lived with him, of course, in Redcliffe Street. Yes, and then Mrs. Johnson gave them some furniture to start off. Mm. We were giving Dylan 25 shillings a week then. And Fred's people were doing the same with him. And Mervyn Levy's people. And then what little extra they could make was from what they were selling of their work. They hadn't reached much in those days to sell very much, of course. No. Then Dylan went ill, and Norman Cameron, a poet, a much older man, took him down to his place and built him up again. He didn't go back then to London to live. He came home to Swansea. No, no, thank you, that is lovely. No more, thank you. Yes, he did a, lot, did a lot of reviewing then for the Daily Telegraph. Oh, he used to be up all night reading these books. Of course, I, I had to stay up with him, giving him cups of coffee to keep him going, you see. And then he'd post the letter down in Wine Street in the general post office by four in the morning sometimes to catch the first post to London. Yes. And then he, his first book came out. Ooh. He met a lot of people then. The Sitwells he met. He was very fond of them. They, they were a bit eccentric, mind. But she was a wonderful friend to Dylan. Wonderful. I don't know. Daddy never believed he'd been a success in any sort of way. But I'll never forget one night. We were listening to In Town Tonight. And uh, the Thursday before, Dylan had been reading in one of these big halls in London. And the Queen and the two princesses were there. And of course, Dylan went on in his tweed suit. And the others, uh, John Gilgood and Edith Evans, Peggy Ashcroft, all dressed as they should be, you see. Anyway, Dylan made a tremendous name. And the next day, the Manchester Guardian came out with this wonderful Welsh poet and all that. And that uh, announcer fellow on the BBC, can't remember his name. Anyway, he got hold of Dylan and was asking him questions about it. Well, I was listening. And suddenly I said, listen, Daddy. talking about how he'd read and about his work. Well, that was the first time we'd ever heard any notice taken of him. <laughs> you know, Daddy used to say, well, there must be something in the boy. <laughs> well, after that, he wanted to go to Dents to, um, uh, to show the, what do we call him, the editor, the head man, the poems that he'd written. Daddy was shocked. You can't go into a big place like that, he said, without an introduction or, or an appointment. And you know, he was such a reserved sort of boy, you couldn't imagine him doing such a thing. Anyway, we all went up to London and uh, he had his big envelope with his poems in now, you see. And we arranged to meet him in Lion's Corner House afterwards. Well, presently, here he comes. No envelope. Oh, I said to Daddy, he's left his poems behind somewhere, you see. So he said, well, how, how did you get on? He mentioned the editor, he'd seen him. And I said, well, you'd left your poems behind somewhere. Oh, they've accepted them, he said, and they're going to publish them. Well, Daddy and I nearly had a fit. Twenty-five poems 
it was. Oh, I'll never forget that day. That was wonderful. Yes, then, then Daddy died. He'd retired early, and Dylan took it very badly. He wrote, Do not go gentle. There's another poem, much better, but I can't find it. it. Must be in a drawer somewhere. He always tried out several before he got to the one he really liked. It's like that with all his work. If he didn't like it, he'd scrap it. Now he's gone too. I believe he knew he was going to die, you know. It was on his mind. He was always talking about death in the last years. Runs through all his writing. Come up, I'd say. Come and see these papers. You ought to know about these things. There'll be things to do when I die. I won't read them. I'll be dead before you, Mother. Oh, don't be foolish, boy. I'm your mother. Mothers die before their children. I won't read them. I'll be dead first. He, he never did. Three times he came to kiss me goodbye. The last time he went to America. Still can't believe I shan't see my boy again. In one year, I lost my whole family. First Daddy, then Nancy, then Dylan. Sometimes it's more than I can bear.